It's, it's obviously a, a, a pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, that's, that's certainly an understatement. Um, I'm going to talk about particles in the air, uh, or as we refer to them, aerosols. That's sort of the, uh, the common designation of particles in the air. So first, where do particles come from? So there are natural sources of particles. This is the plume from Mount Etna on Sicily. And so volcanoes are a source of particles. Actually, volcanoes uh, emit particles uh, that go directly into the stratosphere. And so that, that uh, just because of the heat associated with an emission. This is uh, the coast of Africa. This is dust coming off the Sahara uh, that um, uh, routinely is measured uh, in uh, Miami and in, in the southeastern US. Uh, after it crosses the Atlantic. So dust is a, is a, a, a major component of, of atmospheric uh, particles. Uh, this is a, a satellite photo of uh, southern Africa. And there's, it's a little hard to see the plume of smoke here heading out over the, the, the southern Atlantic. But each of these red dots is a fire that is set to clear uh, the savannas. This is in September of 2000. Um, and the, the, the burning of biomass is the major source of particles in the southern hemisphere. This is uh, uh, India and Bangladesh. Um, here's the Himalayas. And this is a, a, a large plume of, of, uh, of particles from the, the heavily populated industrialized areas. Um, in, uh, uh, in the Indian, adjacent to the Indian Ocean. One of the things that we've, we, we've seen already is that with the advent of satellites, uh, we, we've, we've learned an enormous amount about uh, what's in the atmosphere, both gases and particles. Uh, this is a kind of a synthesis of aerosol optical depth. It's simply a measure of the, of the light scattering and absorption by particles worldwide. And we can see here this, th this is actually uh, this plume of smoke uh, coming, off, uh, uh, coming off Africa over the southern Atlantic. This is um, over Brazil. Uh, this is areas of burning. Uh, then we can see over the US, the southeast US uh, has a lot of um, emissions that, that produce hazes. And then, of course, uh, in Asia, and I'll, I'll come back to this in a moment, uh, areas of, of heavy uh, population and industry. So to get closer to home, uh, this is a, a picture of LA on a nice clear day. And this is the same view on a smoggy day. And uh, I don't know what year this was, but fortunately we're seeing fewer and fewer of days like this in Los Angeles. And a little bit later, I'll come back to Los Angeles and, and, um, and show some results. So what are these particles made of? Uh, this is a, a global compilation of data taken with an, what's called an aerosol mass spectrometer. It's, a, it's an instrument that takes particles in and measures their composition. And, uh, there are various colors here. The organic, which is green, didn't come out too well here. Sulfate is red. Ammonium uh, is the yellow. Nitrate is blue, a little bit for chloride. But to, to a first approximation, particles are roughly half organic. And the rest is, is sulfate, ammonium, and nitrate. These are the big, uh, the big uh, components by mass. And each of these pie charts gives a, um, both an, an annual average in terms of micrograms per cubic meter. That's the mass in the atmosphere. And the winner on this is Beijing with 71 micrograms per cubic meter. And by contrast, if we took, um, say, Macehead, Ireland, which is right on the coast of the Atlantic, uh, 1.5 micrograms per cubic meter. So this could be taken as very clean marine air. And so we, we see there's quite a, a variation in the amount, uh, the mass of particles. Uh, but one of the, 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 um, 
and sort of take-home messages is that uh, wherever you go on Earth, the composition of particles in a broad sense is pretty much the same. Uh, it's about half organics and then half inorganics. Of the organic portion, most of it comes via the gas phase. It's not emitted directly. It, it comes as a result of gas phase chemistry uh, leading to compounds that, are, uh, that will condense. So let's first just look at sulfate. In some ways, that's maybe the easiest thing to look at. So this is a satellite uh, picture, 2005, 2006. This is a satellite that, that will measure the burden of, of SO2. SO2 is emitted from burning sulfur-containing fuels. So this is uh, eastern US. This is the Ohio River, and where there's a, a large number of coal-burning power plants. And so we see the SO2 uh, resulting from those. This is Europe. Um, this, this blob here is actually the sulfate coming from Mount Etna. Uh, so this is uh, the US and Europe. This is a scale here in terms of the, the, the integrated amount of SO2 to the surface. This is China. On the same scale, same year, uh, SO2 emissions uh, the, the integrated amount of SO2 over China. And so um, now, you know, the, 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 there's a great effort going on in China to, to limit the amount of uh, sulfur being emitted by coal burning power plants. Um, and this is, is now well recognized. Again, this, this shows the power of satellites in, in giving us a picture of, of the Earth's uh, atmosphere. Uh, the organic portion turns out to be very complex and exquisite. Uh, the, about uh, uh, as much as 90% of the organics in particles, as I said, come by the gas phase, where volatile compounds are oxidized. Um, and these oxidation products, many of, most of which stay in the gas phase, some of which become sufficiently uh, oxidized and functionalized that they, they become very, uh, uh, very less volatile and they'll condense. And it's this pathway that forms what is called secondary organic aerosol. The secondary refers to the fact that it's the, the products are actually formed in the gas phase. And this was not realized. I think our group was, was probably the first to to kind of quantify this, uh, this, this route to forming the organic portion, which is about half of the, of the Earth's aerosol. And there is a number of compounds I'll, I'll, that, that uh, participate in this route. So as, as Stephen mentioned in the introduction um, about a, how one studies this, uh, it's very difficult to do precise experiments in the atmosphere itself. The air is always moving. Uh, you, you can't really isolate. Um, and so we had the idea of uh, making a large pillow, a large transparent bag in which we could put in what we wanted. It would be exposed to sunlight. Sunlight drives all of atmospheric chemistry. Everything starts with sunlight. And so this is, a, uh, this is where we started. This is on top of one of the buildings at Caltech. Uh, this is a large uh, transparent bag. This is covered because you, you want the experiment to begin at t equals 0 when you take off the cover. And so uh, this is what it looks like uh, when, the, when the cover was off. We first built these in the sort of the mid, early to mid-1980s. Uh, that we, we used this reactor. There was a, a cart with instruments and then a lab next to it. And this is a picture of two of the graduate students at that time uh, doing an experiment. This is Suzanne Paulson, who's now a professor at UCLA, and Spiros Pandas, who's a professor at both Carnegie Mellon and the University of Patras. Uh, well, it turns out that this is not the best way uh, to do experiments. The nice thing about it is you have natural sunlight. 
But the, the, the downside is when it's raining or when it's cloudy, you can't do an experiment. It's too windy. So um, about a decade ago, we built an indoor lab. And I, this is just a list of instruments. But this is the uh, look inside uh, the laboratory where we have these large, the, the same uh, transparent Teflon bags, but now irradiated by uh, essentially special fluorescent bulbs that approximate sunlight, not exactly. And that's, um, uh, that's it's turned out to be a much better way because we can do experiments 365 days a year, as the graduate students will attest. So um, let me talk for a few minutes about this chemistry, uh, this, uh, of, of actually how this process occurs by which these volatile compounds uh, get converted into particles. And what we've learned is that we start with a volatile organic compound. It will react, and the, the OH radical is the atmosphere's detergent. It, it reacts with practically everything. And, and these organic compounds will react with OH to form an oxidized product. So the, you, somehow the, the, the OH will donate its oxygen to the, to the compound. And then if it's sufficiently low volatility, it will, it will partition itself to a particle. And I've shown here a particle by this, this uh, gray area. And this is the compound in the particle phase. But it will continue to react. The, this radical will react with it again, producing an even more oxidized product that will uh, have even lower volatility and condense. And we now understand that this process goes on over many generations. And each time, uh, there's some fragmentation that can occur. The chemistry is, is complex. I'm going to show one slide that's illustrative of this. Uh, but as, the, as this goes on, the, the products become less and less volatile. And they'll condense into the particle phase.